Hi, Daniel. Thanks for making the time to, uh, to talk to me, um, you know, during the weekend. Um, I wanted to talk to you about um, the International Court of Justice, very recent ruling, um, which happened yesterday, on um, the, the occupation of uh, Palestinian territory by, by Israel and what it meant for, under international law. Um, for, for a lot of people well-versed in, uh, in, in the issue, it seems that the court has, has only repeated a few of the things we've, we've known for years now, but the ruling is still called historic by many legal experts, uh, by the Palestinian Authority, by Palestinian legal analysts. Um, so in your opinion, why, why is that so? Well, it's, it's a historic judgment. I want to start with that. It's, it's, some people have already called it one of the most important advisory opinions slash judgments of the International Court of Justice, so, you know, period. Uh, regardless whether on Palestine or anything else, because it's so significant in so many ways. I think it's, to, to those of us who have been talking about these kind of legal issues and campaigning around these legal issues, to have the, the top court in the, on the globe make everything spell things out, sometimes in words of one syllable, very, very clearly, is a game changer should be a game changer. It's a historic judgment because it says certain things which we're going to come on to and which should should have ramifications in the system of enforcement. Look, I want to step back and say something which I think everyone will, will appreciate, but it sometimes just needs spelling out. The law has progressed through the late 20th century into the 21st century while we're stuck in an enforcement system that is from the colonial era. We're, we're stuck with the mid 20th century um, settlement, if you like, of what the UN enforcement mechanisms look like with the, the colonial powers, the key colonial powers at the time, France, Britain, the USA, deciding to bring in Russia, their ally in the, the end of the Second World War, but they knew there were already gonna be problems with Russia and China as a kind of global settlement, uh, but keeping their power with a veto-holding member of the Security Council, and then general other things they've done through their global policies. It's not just the Security Council, but it's just generally we are stuck, frustratingly, with, a, with, a, with the law, with independent judiciary, uh, sometimes at the ICJ, but in many countries, but with a, uh, the enforcement mechanisms, the police forces, the armies, the strong states, with colonial uh, histories and uh, post-colonial power maintained. Um, and that's why it's incredibly frustrating for all of us who see a judgment like this and say, well, even though it's an advisory opinion, this is authoritative statement of the law. It should mean that it's immediately complied with. And there we have the problem. That That's, that's the problem. We have as civil society, as lawyers working in different legal systems, as um, citizens in states which do, the Global South will take this seriously and take it on board. And they need to, to pull all the levers. We need to all pull all the levers to implement this judgment, by which I mean implement the advisory opinions, legal principles. Now, what, if I don't, you don't mind, I will go on to, uh, to just summarise it and I'll summarise it just by reading what the court has put out in its press release where it summarised it. Number one, we now have an illegal occupation. The judges slightly differ as to when, how, what. There's no dispute by, I think it's 14 to 1 in this case. I think one of the judges just disagrees with everything. A few others come in and disagree with certain elements but we've got the vast majority of this powerful court 14 to 1 on this, I believe, says the state of Israel's continued presence in the occupied Palestinian territory is unlawful. The occupation needs to end. It needs to end as soon as is possible. There needs to be reparation. There needs to be a dismantlement of settlements. There needs to be um, a total end without negotiation. Uh, it was put, and I've, I've already heard lawyers talking about this, there's been this dispute, does 
Is Palestine obliged to negotiate its way out of the end of occupation and, you know, swap bits of territory and blah, blah, blah? Absolutely clear. Israel should withdraw, take the settlements apart, give compensation. So the only thing to talk about is how you bring that about in an orderly fashion. So the, the demarcation lines, which people have been debating since Oslo in particular, and they set aside Oslo in effect. Oslo is a redundant um, piece of paper, has been for many, many years, but legally redundant is quite a big step. They basically say, you know, it's neither here nor there. This is an unlawful occupation. What's going on is apartheid. And we can come on to why that's clear. And the the institution of settlements is clearly wrong, um, a breach of the convention, but also forming in its way, it's com the way that it's brought about, clearly annexationist, illegal uh, uh, acquisition of territory through use of force. So, as you say, a lot of these things we've been saying as campaigners, but to have the, the world court say Israel needs to get out and it tells all states in the world and then obliges the UN uh, machinery to step in and do the work of effectively bringing about what they say should happen, which is an end to the occupation as soon as practicable, or words to that effect, um, is a game changer. So that's that's how I try and summarise it. It's, um, in a way, like, it's, it's amazing you know, this, this ruling, because it, it gives, it, I guess, the, the legal community, but also uh, campaigners, organizers, even more tools to fight um, Israel's occupation, apartheid system. Um, but the problem is that, um, I mean, Israel in Gaza right now is bombing UN schools. Uh, which, so, which shows, in a way, the disregard that Israel has for the UN. So um, I know we're going to come back to it, but the question I think that a lot of people, and Palestinians in particular, are, are asking is that, OK, we've got the ICJ in January and then in May, I think, that called for an immediate you know, cessation of hostilities in Gaza. Nothing happened, quite the contrary. We've got the other... Uh, the ICC with the arrest warrants, and we're going to come back to this as well. Uh, now we've got another so-called historic ruling, but the fact is Gaza is still being raised. Uh, the Lancet came with um, research that shows that up, up to 186,000 Palestinians might have died. Or um, So what do we do? So the question is, like, what is the next step? Um, and, yep. and, and again, is it about the UN Security Council? Is it Because, I mean, sorry, but what's very important for people to understand, if I understand correctly, is that what this ruling says is that, you know, to hell with the negotiations, to hell with the Palestinian Mandela, to Israel needs to stop its occupation, period. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So look, I think I think the, the short answer to your question is, is to go back to what I said earlier. We need to work in individual states to try to get them to understand. And and it won't be difficult in some states. South Africa can and other states are very clear about this already. And they can lead the charge bilaterally, in groups, at the General Assembly, to an extent in the Security Council, that we have the problem, obviously, of the permanent five and the veto holding members in this case in particular the United States but before we get to the Security Council and all the problems there individual states campaigners now with some very very uh, governments that are listening particularly in the global south but even in some European countries need to spell out very clearly sanctions this is the only way forward look we now have an illegal occupation it's being called illegal you've been told you mustn't recognise it. There are certain consequences for third party states which are spelled out. The only way of you um, complying with the law now, because this isn't a binding judgment, but it's, it's, a, it's an authoritative statement of the law. The only way you, my state, can comply with the law is by doing a kind of full scale audit of everything that you do in your economic uh, 
and other relations with diplomatic and, uh, and financial and economic arrangements with the, with the State of Israel that perpetuates its illegal occupation. And that was something we campaigned about but you know and advocated for but now we have the key tool we've got the law spelt out in clear terms you must stop this because you're otherwise involving yourself in an illegal act which you mustn't recognize but you must go further you must find a way to get israel to comply with its requirement to give the palestinian people in the opt the right to self-determination which requires you to to withdraw immediately and to you know to set up systems of reparation and to, to put things right and that's the clear language that needs to be used to every state it need they need to go to the general assembly there are things tools in the general assembly there was a special committee on apartheid that is a that is a mechanism within the general assembly to set in motion sanctions now you can um, have resolutions which are which require sanctions at the General Assembly, in my view, they're binding in the general sense. They're not Chapter 7 resolutions which are binding on all members like a Security Council resolution of that kind. But they're still, and they were used, to institute um, sanctions to begin with. I mean, it's, it must be remembered that the sanctions policy against South Africa were General Assembly and a, this Committee against Special Committee Against Apartheid initiatives. And they had a massive impact and hastened the end of apartheid. So it's been done before. It's particularly difficult with how strong the backing is for Israel in, in the US, regardless of which president we end up getting at the end of the year in America. So no one's naive. We're not, um, you know, no one's ignoring that. But there are lots of things that can be done. And if Israel feels the 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 tumult of sanctions uh, boycott divestment sanctions that should now be the global effort but from civil society and as led by certain states then this these gives us this gives us all the tools and all the states that want to do this the tools to make it happen and i believe it will happen um but it's very frustrating, as you say, that we have these ruling upon ruling, and yet the key mechanism that should be doing all the heavy lifting, the Security Council, is virtually out of the picture. If we had that in the picture, obviously things would be very different. But, you know, that's that's not to say we don't have a lot of tools to, to reach for um, as campaigners, as lawyers, um, and, and as leaders, key leaders in key states. Mm. What about people who, who would say that in 2004, the International Court of Justice, in a way, about the wall in the occupied territories, said the same, you know, member states have an obligation to make sure the wall is dismantled, and 20 years later, nothing yeah. has happened. I think, we, um, yeah, yeah, that was a failure on, on the part of a lot of people, including obviously the states that I've mentioned, and there should have been a lot more action. But we're now in a different era. This is this is this is beyond the wall ruling. Um, you know, we obviously shouldn't be sitting here in 20 years time saying, you know, you remember that 2024 um, advisory opinion. It, it was put into the dustbin, which is an exaggeration, but it, it wasn't as effective, nowhere near as effective as the various lawyers like Daniel Macover and others were saying. So, look, his, history will will judge judge the whole position will be, I mean we'll be much wiser in 20 years time as to whether this was the part of a big change in um international relations with Israel Palestine and and a, a turning point for vindicating Palestinian human rights we've got an extremely powerful basically fascist version of Zionism currently at at work and um, no, nothing, very little seems to be impacting on them to stop it. So um, it's it's fully a rogue state now. Um, it, w it has been for a very long time, but these rulings that are coming one after the other and the involvement of the International Criminal Court, even with allies trying to step in and stop it happening, are, are, are ch changing the, the world dynamic in relation to Israel's place in the world. Um, so things may get a lot worse.
for Palestinians on the ground before these these rulings start to take effect and change what Israel has to do. But if Israel does get isolated, if it hits Israelis in their pockets, if they see how isolated they are and understand that and don't just become, you know, more more and more like a hedgehog, um, apologies to hedgehogs, um, you know, but, you know, uh, I hope you understand the metaphor. Um, then yeah, yeah. then we can see change but you know i can't i can't predict um i haven't got a crystal ball but what i can say is that going back to what i said earlier this has to be used and should be used as a tool by by good faith actors campaigners states to to implement a really comprehensive um set of bds yeah, I, I want to ask you, I, I know you, you know, it's hard to, to make predictions, but as someone, um, as a, an in, uh, a citizen, uh, but also a lawyer, a legal expert that has worked on the issue of Palestine for decades, I mean, it, what is your gut feeling? Do you, do you feel that we are experiencing a potential turning point when it comes to how Israel is seen in the world and what it could potentially happen yes for I mean, in, the the Palestinians. Sense, in the sense of world opinion yes in the sense of am, am i confident that we'll have the sanctions that it will start hitting israelis that they will have a change of policy no i can't be confident about that i i wish i were there are all the opportunities to make that happen but but uh when i look in the crystal ball it's too murky for that uh the opportunity is there and we have to seize it and see where it takes us um but you know the, the the election of a new president trump in america with the power that america wields could interfere with all of that all the a lot of the states in the world including the european union though i with germany's current policies it's going to be difficult for the european union as a whole to take a, the right stance but individual states might might start doing so um and i wouldn't rule out a change of policy in europe um but uh, those, those, there are too many uh, difficult contrary factors to, to be confident that we're at the point of Palestinian liberation and, and, and the exercise of self-determination. So, um, but as um, nonetheless, as, as a strong friend of mine, Palestinian lawyer friend of mine, Raji Zurani, says we have to maintain our strategic optimism. Uh, and I feel that if if that's what Palestinian lawyers and friends are saying to us, then it's not for us to to look at the world differently to that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and certainly I want to support that strategic optimism and and put put more uh yeah. put more in the engine, if you like help mm. to power that strategic optimism but having said that anyone who has strategic optimism also has to understand what what's getting in the way of uh, that being realized mm. uh, and what we need to try and do about it but there is certainly lots that can be done to push the other way and that's what we all need to do in terms of putting our shoulder to the wheel quickly what about in terms of like third parties or other states obligations because people might again look at this ICJ ruling and says and say it's non it's non-binding so it doesn't matter but do you think that there's actually clear legal actions also that could be undertaken in the UK in France in, in yeah. Germany yeah I, I, I look I've touched on this already um, it, it's absolutely clear there are parts of the the ruling which which are directed at like the wall ruling directed at states to take to take action um i would like that to have been even stronger but by and large it sort of says look you, you, the general assembly and the un security council need to take charge of this and in all other international bodies but it does direct the states there are certain things which are made clear in it um and and we can we can look at that um you know in the opinion itself um I mean, one one needs to look at towards the end, basically, of the of that judgment. Um, 
I know it's a bit clunky to read from it, but it, it, there are whole sections towards the end of that judgment, um, which are all about um, the what what the duties of uh, third party states are. So if I could turn to it, um, bear with me a second. Um, so obviously the it goes through all the um, the aspects of the occupation which which make it unlawful. Um, and the, the apartheid issue, which will, um, and then it, it finishes with a whole section which begins on seven, page 73, it's an 80 page ruling. Um, legal consequences arising from Israel's policies and practices and from the illegality of Israel's continued presence in the OPT. And it talks about the legal consequences for Israel, several of which we've touched on. And the legal consequences for other states is non-recognition, mustn't recognize any of this illegality. With regard to self-determination right, the court considers while it's for the General Assembly and Security Council, which is what I was saying earlier, to pronounce um, all states must cooperate with the United Nations to put those modalities into effect. As recalled in an, another case, every state has a duty to promote, etc. As regards their prohibition on the acquisition of territory by force, um, it's pointed out various previous rulings. Um, and it, there must be there's a duty upon non -rec of non recognition of anything that's unlawful, and it goes into that in more detail. Um, and then it it talks about and these are the the key paragraphs which I had in mind. There are two seven eight and two seven nine, and effectively, and this is this is the this is the point which I was coming to, Frank, and the point which has resonance in legal systems throughout the world. This is a key thing. The court considers, in view of the character and importance of the rights and obligations, this is paragraph 279 of the judgment, involved, all states are under an obligation, and this is not just to recognise as legal, so they mustn't recognise as legal, they're also, this is the key thing, under an obligation not to render aid or assistance in maintaining the situation created by Israel's illegal presence in the OPT. It is for all states while respecting the Charter of the United Nations and international law to ensure that they implement resulting from the illegal presence of, the o of Israel in the OPT to the exercise of the Palestinian people, the right, its right to self-determination, is brought to an end. In addition, all states parties to the Fourth Geneva Convention have the obligation, while respecting the Charter, to ensure compliance by Israel with international humanitarian law as embodied in that convention. So these are positive duties. They've got to act. So I would say the impact of that in a state which is acting in good faith is they do a kind of audit. What, are, what do all of our relations with Israel involve? Are, is anything we're doing aiding or assisting the perpetuation of the occupation? And I would say virtually everything <laughs> that any state is doing with Israel. They've got to cut off diplomatic relations, cease economic relations, because everything that's doing, sustaining the Israeli state currently as it is, is perpetuating the occupation. Selling arms to it is perpetuating the occupation. So, you know, I think the audit is quite short. <laughs> the audit is asking them the question, is anything we're doing rendering aid or assistance to this per con continuing unlawful act that which the world court is telling us we should be acting, we must be acting, to bring to an end. Mm -hmm. We must be helping the Palestinians to exercise their right of self-determination. So virtually everything that, that involves Israel where is, is in fact helping yeah. them, in my view. They're, 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 that's a legal argument, that's not politics. Yeah. Uh, obviously this has political resonance, but these, these, this is a statement to me of the law as applied to different states when they read this in good faith. Uh, but obviously, there's a minority of states, a lot of the global south will read this in good faith, and hopefully led by states like South Africa. Um, I'm using South Africa as a kind of shorthand, partly because they brought the ICJ case on genocide, but also because they they have led in various other respects, and because they lead, obviously partly because of the, the history of, of South African apartheid, and, and bringing about the post-apartheid era in their country. Uh, so they have a lot of moral authority. Um, but there are many states that will be thinking in the same way. A lot of uh, South American states, we know that, a lot of Asian states. Um, 
unfortunately not enough of the Arab world because they're being sucked into this Abraham Accords logic of of the successive US administrations. Um, but the Arab masses, the, the, the citizens of Arab countries need to be speaking to their governments and getting them to apply this in good faith. Mm. So um, I, I want to wrap up now, but um, it feels like a, a huge win in a way also for the BDS movement that has, you know, the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement that have been called as, you know, as called for sanctions and against Israel for many years. Another win in a way is um, potentially changing the dictionary or the words we use when we describe what's happening in Palestine. For years, Palestinians um, have been saying it's apartheid. Uh, then, 10 years later, Amnesty, or 10 years or 15 years later, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Betzalem also yeah. said it's apartheid. But now we've got the highest judicial body in the world that also says it's apartheid, right? Absolutely. It's, 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 and that, that's why when we started this conversation, we were talking about, you asked about its significance. It is a game changer. It changes the discourse. It changes political discourse, it changes the legal discourse. And in terms of the importance of what you mentioned, as you said, um, uh, for many years, Palestinian lawyers, activists were saying repeatedly what, what we're living with, what we've seen in relation not just to the occupied territories, of course, is a system of apartheid applied to the Palestinians. And it's it, at its starkest, it's where there are no Palestinians exercising any right to vote really over their existence because of the poor nature of the the, 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 the post-Oslo settlement. Um, that's the under Israeli occupation. Um, and this court says, in relation to Article 3 of the Convention for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and it's worth just reading what they read out and saying, because it's, it, it is clear that they found there is apartheid. State parties particularly condemn racial segregation and apartheid and undertake to prevent, prohibit and eradicate all practices of this nature in territories under their jurisdiction. So having quoted that provision, they then go on to describe, so I won't repeat it, the system of segregation and separateness that exists between Palestinians and Israeli citizens who have moved into the, unlawfully moved, into the occupied territories. And then concludes, the court observes that Israel's legislation and measures impose and serve to maintain a near complete separation in the West Bank and East Jerusalem between the settler and Palestinian communities. For this reason, the court considers that Israel's legislation and measures constitute a breach of Article 3 of third. Now, what would have been nice is a repetition of the word apartheid, but it's unnecessary. The context earlier in that ruling that I read from means that paragraph 229, which is a bit I just read from, is an unambiguous finding of practices of segregation and apartheid. So the language is there, the tools are there, the work we've been doing and others across the globe have been doing to, to, to bring this to the fore, all of these issues, has now been vindicated in this advisory opinion. So we are now at a different stage. We now have to say, here it is. States, listen, apply. Yeah. We, you may have said we were whistling in the wind when we were talking to you 20, 25, 30 years ago. But you can't ignore us anymore. Or you shouldn't be able to ignore us anymore because this is authoritative. My final final question um, is, does this judgment have any implications on the ICC case, the International uh, Criminal Court, where Karen Khan has asked yeah. for arrest warrants? Yes. Well, I think it's got two ramifications. One is the analysis of the occupation and of settlements and of settler violence all lead in the direction of more because we know arrest warrant applications in respect of Israel's conduct in the West Bank. So there, it's grist to the mill of all of that analysis. And many of us, I and lots and lots of campaigners, Palestinian human rights organisations have been saying, what the hell are you doing about the West Bank? 
when you've had settlements as an Israeli policy forever, and you've got a chain of command that's as long as your arm, and you could be potentially deterring further settlement activity, as you would deter any criminality, by putting forward arrest warrants in relation to settlements. So in relation to what wasn't already part of the arrest warrant, it provides um, process currently, it provides further arguments. But there is one important footnote. Because of the reference several times to the Oslo Accords and their irrelevance for the purposes of determining this, the questions that were before this court, it does have a relevance to the recent uh, attempt by the conservative, outgoing Conservative government, and we'll see whether the Labour government maintains its position as of Friday the 26th of July, which its current deadline for, for putting in a submission to the ICC chamber, which the previous government was granted permission to do, where they say there's an Oslo issue. Because um, the Palestinian Authority agreed under Oslo that in areas under its control, um, it wouldn't exercise criminal jurisdiction over Israeli nationals, that it can't delegate something it doesn't have. This is property law concept, first of all. It's totally irrelevant to the process of an international court. But also it just doesn't make sense. Because, in a way, each... So let me just give you a couple of examples. I'm sorry to extend it, but this is important to understand. Many states, when they ratified the Rome Statute, they didn't necessarily introduce pure universal jurisdiction into their legal system. So when they, when there's the start of a process that could be looking at crimes committed by their nationals or on their territory by non-nationals, if it were the case that Oslo presents a problem, then many states can't delegate a universal jurisdiction that they've never brought about in their own legal system. So this is there's so much legal nonsense around this argument that I don't know where to begin. And it shouldn't have been even given, um, you know, the, the light of day that there could be this problem. Because essentially what happens is when you have a supranational body and a treaty system, then you're, you're, you're not delegating anything. You're creating a, a, a structure within which they will exercise jurisdiction. And once you, once you pass all the jurisdictional barriers, the problems you may have internally day by day exercising jurisdiction in a particular way that that body has, you've agreed through a treaty, will have, means it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. The only way it is, becomes relevant is Palestine can rightly say, in terms of complementarity, well, Israel isn't doing anything, and we can't do anything. So there isn't a legal system that's operating to bring Israeli suspects to justice. Um, even though we could break the Oslo Accords and try to exercise criminal jurisdiction. But that's all irrelevant. It's, it comes down to, is there a reason why you should be exercising jurisdiction? Well, Oslo provides another reason. It doesn't provide another barrier. It provides an extra reason when you get to the point of, should is there a, a problem with complementarity? Is there a problem with, literally, the, court, the local area not exercising justice? And that's one of the issues that the court will have to grapple down the line, but it shouldn't stop the arrest warrants. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks again. Um, this was, as usual, uh, illuminating and, um, and very, um, you know, very interesting. So thanks, thanks again, and also for doing this on a Saturday. No problem. Well, look, I look forward to hearing lots of others debating it who are even, you know, international lawyers who are even m much better versed than me, really, in, in um, international law and the, the relevance of advisory opinions and judgments of the ICJ, because this debate needs to continue. We need to get more and more sophisticated and have stronger and stronger arguments for the kind of points I was raising, or understand if there are weaknesses in those arguments, mm -hmm. where they lie. But I'm confident that what I said earlier is the starting point a sound starting point for the yeah. debate and maybe we can be even more ambitious in terms of how how things go at the general assembly because i, I think there is a, le a degree of confidence among some lawyers that the general assembly can do rather more than it has in the past but time will tell but thank you again frank thanks Daniel.